Mitchell Peters, ATU number 19 from his advanced snare drum studies is uh, in an ABA form, three-part form, which is uh, separated uh, by a contrasting B section, which is in 6-8, and the outer sections, the A sections, are in 2-4. Uh, thinking about the piece in these three parts is really helpful in sort of categorizing the types of playing that you'll need to do in each section. In the opening 2-4 section, we get uh, immediately our extremes and dynamic. Within the first couple of bars, we hear both our loudest playing and our softest playing. We really need to spread apart this dynamic spectrum as much as possible. And we have to set the tone right up front so that we understand for the rest of the piece just how wide that dynamic spectrum is going to be. In order to achieve uh, this great range in dynamics, I'm utilizing different beating spots on the head. For my loud playing, I'm playing just off the center of the drum in order to get as much depth to the sound as possible. And by contrast, for my softest playing, I am moving out very close to the edge of the drum. Going out to the edge does thin out the sound, uh, but that does assist with getting the dynamic as low as it needs to get especially within the pianissimo sections. One thing to watch out for when you do this, when you use these different beating spots on the drum, is to make sure that you're always getting great snare reaction at the edge. If the drum isn't tuned properly, if the snares aren't at the right tension underneath the drum, then we lose that snare reaction the closer we get to the edge. Take time to tune the drum to make sure that the heads are at the appropriate tension and that the snares underneath are that the, at, at the appropriate tension so that you can fully utilize the range of the drum. Be sure to utilize the slow tempo audio selections within the first section to make sure that all of these 30 second note rhythms are really accurate and really correct. It looks really fast on the page. In fact, it's not that fast, but we do need to make sure that all of the divisions of time within this 30 second note grid are perfect before we push tempo uh, closer to where we're going to perform it. At the very end of the first uh, section, the A section, as we're getting ready to transition from 2-4 into 6-8, uh, that transition is set up the bar before through a series of triplets, which then become the new subdivision of the beat. You can think about the big beat staying consistent. So your quarter note that equals 72 at the beginning that quarter note will equal the dotted quarter note, or the next big beat in the 6-8. So your dotted quarter note will equal 72 within the 6-8 section. And the triplets that come just before that section really carve up that beat into its smaller subparts perfectly. So we can start that subdivision in our mind as we go into that first roll. The first roll we see in the piece is at the beginning of the 6-8 section. And immediately we have to make some decisions about roll speed and what the rhythmic pacing is going to be underneath your rolls throughout the various parts of this section. It's very easy to think, well, let's just keep things in the 16th note grid. But at quarter note equals 72 and then dotted quarter equals 72, that 16th note grid is just a little bit too slow, especially for some of the louder dynamics. I'm going to demonstrate just the first couple of bars utilizing the 16th note grid for the rolls. While you can make this roll work, it really takes a great deal of effort in order to make it wide enough in order to connect from hand to hand as you move through that particular pacing. I'm using a really wide triple bounce roll in order to make all of those connections. For me, I'd like to actually speed that roll up so we can actually fill up that sound a little bit more. These are the first rolls that we're going to hear and they happen at a loud dynamic. So they really have to have a lot of body. I actually put, instead of uh, six strokes as a rhythmic underlay, I put seven strokes so that I'll start on my right hand and end up on my left hand as I play these first dotted quarter note rolls. Now this approach may not be for younger players, but any time that you can utilize an odd number grouping as your rhythmic bass 
to a roll. It obscures the beat and it obscures that rhythmic underlay so that we as the listener don't perceive it to be a rhythm underneath, but simply just a sustain, which is what a roll is supposed to be. Now that's not always possible and sometimes our hands simply need to sort of flow along with a passage and fall into a grid in order to facilitate uh, the ease of playing. And I actually do that after we get through the first couple of bars. So once we get into bar 21 and 22, I do fall into that 16th note grid here because they're much shorter and I don't have to sustain them for quite as long. So we'll use that at the eighth note level through these two bars. And then afterwards, I try to go back to some odd number groupings again to try to obscure the rhythmic underlay. In the entire 6-8 passage, uh, many times when it's written so, we need to feel sort of this, this lilting three back and forth, emphasizing perhaps a little bit more on the strong beats, beat one and beat four. There are a couple of episodes where Peters actually obscures that feel and we're chopping up the bar in different ways. The first time we see that is in measure 22, when he gives us a big three against the big two in the bar. And he does this through a series of rolls and rhythms. So instead of feeling the bar as one, two, three, four, five, six, the bar is felt as a larger three. One, two, three. Mm. Later in this section, he'll go back and forth between these two feels and how he chops up both the bar itself and the beats within the bar, obscuring three against two and back and forth. Measures 26 through 29 are particularly difficult one, because of the, di the dynamic that we're playing. But on top of that, we have uh, this very challenging ornament uh, to insert within the rhythmic line. The rhythm here is just a series of eighth notes with different uh, accents distributed throughout. But we have these four stroke roughs that we have to execute at a very uh, small dynamic. And to make matters a little bit more challenging, at the end of the passage, we have two of these episodes that occur back to back. In order to execute these four stroke drags at the soft dynamic, I'm using a very specific sticking and a sticking that actually incorporates a bit of a rebound stroke instead of just singling these ornaments. The sticking I'm using is right, left, left, right each time the four stroke rough comes. I'm also playing all of the eighth notes on the right hand for a sake of consistency. So the left hand will be inserted just on these rebound strokes in order to get the ornaments out. Let me demonstrate this sticking very slow once so you can see the execution. I'm going to play this passage slowly one time and I'm going to open up the roughs so that we can hear all of the notes in each ornament. In order to practice these couple of bars, start slowly, make sure that you're executing each note within the ornament, and also don't challenge yourself to be too soft too soon. Play at a comfortable dynamic, and as you speed up, you can also start to condense the dynamic. Slowly but surely, as you increase tempo, the space between the eighth notes will obviously shrink. As that space shrinks, we also need to shrink that ornament and make it as tight as possible so as not to disrupt the rhythmic flow. But be careful as you do this to not obscure the four notes. Really strive to have execution at a level where we can distinctly hear all four of those notes in this passage. your private lesson instructor or band director might offer a different approach, approach through this passage, which is fine. As long as we don't disrupt rhythm, and as long as those ornaments are consistent throughout this passage, you'll be in great shape. In measures 43 and 44, we have an example of carving up the bars in different ways. 
In bar 43, instead of feeling a subdivision of three-eighths within each big beat, we now are feeling it in a subdivision of two. Roll, da 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 roll, da 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 followed by, in 44, four rolls that subdivide the big beats in the same way. Roll, 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 roll. 44 is set up perfectly by the material that's presented in 43. And if you can get your mind to start thinking in two in these big beats rather than three, you can play these measures more convincingly. So sing these bars to yourself a couple of times. You can think about snapping the big beats and within, carving up each big beat into two. Now back to our earlier discussion of trying to find different ways to manipulate the rolls and roll speeds. In measure 43, rather than using a 16th note uh, bass to, to, to the roll, I actually throw one extra note into each of these rolls. It puts me off on an odd hand, but I think it fills up the sound a little bit more. In measure 44, we need to put some separation between these rolls. Rather than connecting them one to the next, we're lifting a little bit before reinstigating the next roll. I'm using a three note uh, rhythmic underlay and simply lifting before re-entering on the next instance of the roll. The following two bars, measures 45 and 46, carve up the bar in different ways. Here, instead of thinking about carving up the two big beats, we're actually subdividing the entire measure differently. So instead of thinking two beats, we're actually carving it up into three beats, as we did a little bit earlier in the section. So instead of hearing these bars as one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, you can hear them as a division of a larger three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Just as the previous two bars set the tone one bar to the next, these do the same. In bar 45, we have these short rolls which start the division into three as opposed to two. And in bar 46, we have longer rolls which keep that division of the bar. In these bars, instead of hearing one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm thinking one, two, three, roll, two, three, end. In bar 45, because these rolls are so, so short, taking place only over one sixteenth note uh, as they each occur. We're just using one hand to execute that roll, trying to get as uh, much length to that roll as possible. I'm still thinking of a triple bounce roll here and trying to connect it to the very next sixteenth note that comes afterwards. In measure 46, again, we have this approach where we need to lift a little bit in order to create some separation. We also have accents here that we didn't have two bars before. Here I'm putting four notes within the rhythmic underlay of the first two rolls. And then with the third roll, because we're actually tying this into the downbeat of the next bar, I'm playing through this all the way to that next downbeat and filling up with actually six notes of rhythmic underlay. The last couple of bars of the 6-8 section have some more challenging flam passages. It starts out a little bit easy, but then gets pretty difficult pretty quick, culminating with bar 51, where really in order to execute these at the tempo given, the best idea is probably to incorporate flam taps in order to work your way through the first part of this bar. In bar 51, while it may be possible to play all of these 16th notes with one hand and slide the ornaments in with the left hand, in order to really sort of get the appropriate feel of the bar and to have a more relaxed approach uh, to this challenging passage, the flam taps really do allow us to sort of open ourselves up a little bit more, relax a little bit more, and not have to worry about throwing out a series of 16th notes in one hand and basically overusing one of our arms over the other.
Make sure that there's a, enough separation between the two notes in your flam that it actually feels like a different event so that these ornaments are, are ornaments that actually stand out a little bit more. Don't collapse the flam so much that it simply just sounds like an accent. Use the spacing that you have in order to get the flam as wide as possible. There's not a ton of space to work with, but make sure that the sticks aren't falling on top of each other throughout this section. In measure 53, we get a recap from the beginning, and we have uh, our A section back again. Uh, there's many similarities between uh, this A section and the first one. Uh, some slight uh, rhythmic differ differences along the way, but the approach to all of this is going to be very similar to what we used in the first A section. At the very end of the piece, we have a final gesture, which is a written out rhythmic increase. The effect here is that the notes are simply getting faster and culminating into our final note. Be sure that we aren't just playing a series of slow to fast notes, but that we're being really, really meticulous about the rhythm. While all of this is under one dynamic gesture, we need to make sure that we are hearing a triplet, a series of 30 second notes, and then a series of 30 second note quintuplet culminating in the final note.